When I agreed to provide a presentation for your pro, pro seminar, I was given five questions to address. I believe that this part of the presentation covers all five of the questions. Plus, it should give you a unique look at human research that is done to support spaceflight and an idea of how weightlessness environments affect humans as living, adapting organisms. It also gives you an idea of the complexity of doing research associated with space and understanding of just how dangerous weightlessness can be. I also want you to understand that just because the research is done through a federal life sciences program, that the work is funded, just, but the work is essentially funded just like any work that the government supports. That is, this work was done through responding to a call for proposals. The proposals were submitted and were competed with universities around the globe. So, understanding of the call for the research, your proposal writing, and assemble a team that wins. What I'm going to cover now is essentially uh, what space flight's like, and what's the future going to look like, perhaps. And in particular, talk about the effects of space flight on vestibular and sensory motor function. So a quick overview shows that uh, spatial orientation and sensory motor responses to gravity changes are what we're investigating primarily. The outcome of that, of course, is uh, uh, right up front, space motion sickness, uh, changes in posture and locomotion, and uh, being able to perform functionally following the space flight, and the time that it takes to recover, for example. And then talk a little bit about uh, countermeasures. We see the biggest changes uh, when we launch into space at, the, gra at the, the gravitational transitions, both from the Earth to, uh, in this case, uh, the orbit, and then when we deorbit and return back to the ground. We, those are the points that we see the, the greatest changes in functional behavior. This essentially is just a, a short diagram that shows it's when we say vestibular, we're really talking about the vestibular system, but we're also talking about this, the sensory systems in the body that inter, interact and are integrated with the vestibular system. Uh, the visual system, for example, proprioceptive responses, uh, the tactile symptoms uh, system, and uh, we, we see where those things are all integrated in the central nervous system. Uh, the output, of course, is uh, uh, we're able to control our movement and maintain clear vision is two of the really important aspects. Sensory motor dysfunction during adaptation to G, uh, G transitions uh, that we typically see um, are particularly on return to, to Earth, uh, postural and gait instability, uh, serious, very serious. Visual performance changes, uh, manual control disruptions, uh, spatial disorientation, and, of course, space motion sickness, the one thing that most people are familiar with. The, the outcome of that is that, uh, say you're, you've transitioned from uh, lunar orbit to, to the moon, and you've been in space already 20 days. You're going to have control of the vehicle uh, problems if you have a rover. Uh, they are going to be uh, impaired emergency egress uh, capabilities, and there are going to be falls. We saw lots of falls the last time we were on the moon. Uh, the falls are dangerous, not so much that, you know, something like a 6G is going to have a fairly significant impact uh, within a spacesuit, but uh, tearing a hole in a spacesuit uh, 
is a really uh, valid look at what would happen in terms of uh, losing a crew member or uh, losing all of the science. Uh, the risk factors that are associated with uh, the changes that we would see uh, on, on G transitions, particularly back to uh, 1G environment or the length of the flight, uh, how long were you in orbit? How long were you in transition? Uh, what kind of workload and the complexity of that workload uh, did you have to experience? Uh, the uh, fact is that we see a great deal of individual variability, uh, and that's not always going to be predictable. Um, the use of medication in preparation for uh, transitions is something that's also a risk factor, very much so. Uh, and the architecture, who designed it? Do they understand what the design means? And have they considered most of the problems that you know that people are going to face? The changes that we see in what we call vestibular, but again, it's really the, the, the orientation system that we're talking about, uh, that occur uh, during the uh, uh, entry into a weightless state, is that you get a, a gain change in the vestibular ocular reflex. And we'll come back to that a little bit more later. Uh, we see now that we're beginning to understand and actually are finding it in our animal models that there are morphological functional changes in the otolith structure itself that have a big impact on, uh, on what we see, particularly when we return back to Earth. Spatial disorientation is an issue once you launch and enter another vehicle like a station, space station, uh, uh, you are in a whole new world. If you look at the International Space Station, for example, you could compare that to a uh, modern ranch home that had several different uh, uh, hallways in, in it, for example, except do that in a three-dimensional uh, model, and it's easy to see how people could be, become disoriented. Up or down becomes a problem. That's a problem even in a stationary uh, shuttle, for example. Um, things are going to look different to you. Uh, things are lost, for example. That's a good example of how things look different. Uh, we've even lost very large cameras. I, I think about it in terms of uh, trying to find something in the refrigerator. With That's a three-dimensional volume. And uh, uh, they, if you look at them slightly differently, you'll just never see them. Take, for example, a pen or a pencil. If you put it to float in the air in, in, a, in a spacecraft and you can't find it, it could be because you're looking either along the long length of it and seeing the end of the pencil, one end or the other. Uh, it looks different. You can't find it. Uh, Motion sickness, of course, is going to happen when you enter a weightless state. The basic response that you hear from most people is simply, I don't want to move. And moving mass can be a problem as well. The, the weight is gone, but uh, handling something very large could actually become very dangerous. When we uh, enter a weightless state, uh, there's uh, going to be, particularly with uh, the, the moment that the main engine uh, cutoff occurs, is that uh, you'll experience somersaulting sensation. And, and not all people do, but uh, a great, great many of them do. And that's particularly true if you have your eyes closed. Uh, you get essentially sometimes the same kind of uh, sensation during parabolic flight, for example. Uh, once they're in a weightless state, even for a few minutes, 
people begin to feel upright uh, with their eyes open or closed. There is no sensation of falling. Falling essentially is visually and cognitively mediated. Even though you're in a constant state of fall in a weightless environment in orbit around the Earth, uh, the visual scene appears stationary uh, during head movements. That is, there's no abnormal oscillopsy that might occur uh, once you begin to adapt or once you have adapted. Uh, I, I promised uh, one person there that I would, would essentially give you a demonstration of uh, how the vestibular system effectively uh, uh, controls eye movements. You, you're a, the, the nervous system makes about five different types of eye movements. Four of those are clearly coupled with the vestibular system. Um, I don't know how many in this class has uh, uh, an intact vestibular system, uh, and it'd be interesting for me to, to uh, get some feedback in terms of what people see after this demonstration that I'm going to give you. Uh, you get to see how the vestibular ocular reflex works in a functional in a functioning uh, vestibular system. If you look at the lines in the palm of your hand, for example, and uh, you, you essentially move your head back and forth at about one hertz, you can see that the lines remain clear and distinct. You can see them very easily. That's because the vestibular system is driving the eyes equally and opposite the head movement. You can watch somebody else's eyes while they do this exercise. Now, take your hand and uh, hold it there and move it either side to side or up and down at about one hertz. It's very difficult to see the lines because the vestibular system is uh, not compensating for that movement and, and essentially... Uh, the visual system is very slow. So people that are having vestibular problems typically see, for example, the blurred lines. They have trouble reading uh, for the very same reason. One of the th experiences that many people have on entering a weightless state is the inversion illusion. Titov was... Uh, the second person in space for the Russians, of course. Uh, that was clear back in 1962. And uh, he uh, uh, immediately on the enter, entering a weightless environment felt as if he were upside down. Uh, even when visually uh, he was upright within the cabin. And it, this sensation persisted. Uh, with the eyes closed. Fluid shift, uh, visceral evaluation, and odolith unloading likely contribute to this. What all that means is essentially that uh, if I am uh, seated and buckled into that seat, uh, I may be able to override some of the effect of an inversion illusion simply because I have uh, all the proprioceptive uh, in my rear end uh, tied to a stable surface. If you float up a little bit, you may feel immediately that you inverted. Um, <clears throat> and it's temporarily reversible with, uh, like I say, uh, visual cues as well as the proprioceptive. Uh, and it's uncommon for most people to have it after the first day in flight or even actually after a few minutes. But Titov was uh, unusual. And we've seen people in, in parabolic flight, for example, uh, novices, that uh, get it every time they fly. And it lasts throughout the entire flight. I've only experienced it once myself uh, early on during the uh, parabolic flight activity. Uh, Probably more than 25% of the crew experience it. Visual reorientation illusion, which is, which is unique uh, to space flight. Uh, the surface of your feet uh, seems like a floor. Uh, 
uh, surfaces parallel to the body seem like the walls. Just what you would expect. Even if you're upside down, where your feet are is where the floor is. The orientation of your own body or that of another person you look at can redefine what's down. So if you're standing on the ceiling, I quote, put ceiling in quotes, and the other person is standing on the floor, uh, you may feel like you're upside down or vice versa. Probably uh, the probability of illusions depending on visual vertical cues, uh, visual attention, and how familiar you are with the interior of the vehicle that you're in. Uh, it, the, the reorientation illusion does occur spontaneously, but you can cognitively uh, reverse it. Uh, incidence is almost universal in all crew members. Uh, susceptibility can persist for months. Uh, one of the things that's interesting about this is that uh, is, is that initially people feel down is where their feet are. Uh, then it sort of evolves into what what is the, my orientation uh, to the spacecraft with the long axis of my body. And uh, feet become less important. Uh, that it seems to involve over time to be where is my chin to the top of my head? And that may change and eventually end up uh, with uh, the position of the eyes in your skull, defining your up and down. EVI height, uh, EVA height vertigo is something that a lot of people don't ex experience, uh, but, but it occurs most frequently, of course, uh, on EVAs, that is, extravehicular activities. And when it occurs, it can, it can apparently be extremely frightening. Uh, you feel that you could fall, uh, even though you have no sensation of falling. Uh, and you suddenly gain an enhanced, enhanced awareness of uh, the fact that the vehicle you're with is moving, and moving very fast across the earth. Uh, what happens is that the natural compulsion is to hang on to something that you can hang on to. Uh, it's, it's happened several times, particularly aboard the, the Soyuz, Soyuz space station, where uh, people literally had to be pried away from hanging on to an item on the external uh, surface of the spacecraft because they couldn't move. Uh, if they turn away from the Earth, typically the Earth is going to be at your feet in these conditions, uh, and getting the spacecraft below you instead of the Earth uh, typically can resolve the, the issue very fast. Weightless navigation problems is another thing, and I sort of alluded to this earlier, that uh, if you live in a three-dimensional a uh, ranch home with hallways going up, down, to the sides, and even at angles, uh, you're going to have a problem developing a map, a cognitive map of, uh, of the modules and how they're related to each other. And this can produce motion sickness very fast. As a matter of fact, one of the, uh, one of the uh, most provocative moves when we were flying the shuttle that had a space lab attached to it through a tunnel was that uh, when you left the mid-deck of the shuttle, you were upright. Uh, as you got into the tunnel, you maintained your position of what was upright. But uh, in entering the space lab, it was 180 degrees reversed. And some people immediately threw up when they entered it when they exited that tunnel. Uh, it's, been hap it's been true that uh, depending on the space station and where the docking occurs that uh, people do get lost. Yeah, I, now I'd like to talk to you about uh, uh, the development of, of uh, uh, putting together a 
new experiment strategy. Uh, in this case, taking what we, we know and what the crew members look like and how the crew members can function after a flight, uh, what can we do in order to show the, uh, the decompensation and the ability to function after a landing? And uh, we, we did this by working directly with the, the Russians as well as our space agency. And it was a rather complex thing to do. In the first place, we had to put together the proposal, which is very difficult. Uh, we wanted to use USOS. When I say USOS, I mean uh, astronauts from the United States and Japan and Europe and uh, then the Russian cosmonauts. Uh, in order to do this, we wanted to look at the people just as quickly after landing as we possibly could, which meant taking everything to the field where the Soyuz capsule was going to land. And um, we had to develop then a mobile lab that allowed us to do that, essentially meaning that uh, whatever hardware it took to do this in the testing it had to be carried on the back. Uh, so we had to keep things very simple. Uh, we wanted to concentrate on vestibular and cellular and sensor, sensory motor functionality. Uh, in order to do this, we took the approach of using essentially uh, the kind of testing that's done with uh, uh, people that are becoming more elderly and have trouble doing things. In other words, we wanted to look at behaviors of uh, everyday functionality. And uh, then for the last part, we wanted to test multiple times within the first 24 hours of landing to look at some sort of time concept which was going to show us how quickly people were in fact recovering. In order to do this, it became extremely complicated. The number of, of divisions within NASA, particularly those at the Johnson Space Center and at NASA headquarters, uh, was became really complex. Uh, typically, we only operate out of our own division, but here we were using uh, MedOps and uh, various working groups, including the astronaut office and uh, and getting a permission to do the, this kind of work with our institutional review board and uh, then our directorate and uh, NASA human research programs and, uh, and so on. Uh, then we had to put together on the Russian side the same kind of organization, essentially, that would allow us to do this. So it was very, very complex. So general observations in terms of the field test that uh, we were we ended up seeing is that uh, is that every returning crew member exhibits undoubtedly vestibular, cerebellar, and sensory motor decrements. Uh, in some cases, to the extreme, every crew member experiences landing motion sickness, and when I say every crew member, I mean every crew member. Typically, in the past, we didn't really look that, that hard at the returning crew member in terms of uh, getting good data that shows the number of people that were, in fact, motion sickness during the landing process. Uh, what we found is essentially that there were considerable variations between crew members. And that's why I like this particular photograph. If you see... Uh, the two people in blue suits are, are cosmonauts. Uh, the one on your right is the commander of the flight. The one on the left is the flight engineer. Uh, the huge difference between these two people is clearly shown in this photograph. The commander uh, was probably one of the least affected people that we, we saw uh, during all of the testing we did for the field test. He's walking on his own. He's walking very well. Uh, 
He did have motion sickness, but he essentially looked fairly unaffected. The flight engineer, on the other hand, is essentially being carried by three people. This was a, about four hours, or close, probably closer to five hours, after landing at the Karaganda uh, Airport. And the last thing is that uh, with the multiple testing that we were doing after the flight, that is, immediately after uh, then it's uh, on a, uh, um, I'll show you on the next slide. Yeah, here are the timelines for testing. We, uh, we tested about one hour after landing, or just as quickly as we could. Uh, if there was some reason why we couldn't test in the field because snow had come in or weather was a problem, then uh, we tested at the, the Karaganda Airport which was three to four hours, typically after landing. Uh, then we tested at uh, what's called the uh, um, direct return home to the Johnson Space Center of the astronauts. Uh, and uh, that is done typically in the Netherlands uh, when they land for fuel. And so that's somewhere between 10 and 12 hours. And then we tested again uh, within 24 hours uh, after they returned to Johnson Space Center. Uh, testing afterwards, you can see here. The protocols that we selected, like I say, we were more interested in, in everyday functionality, everyday living kinds of scenarios. So we used, uh, for example, a sit to stand. Uh, seated in a chair and standing up as quickly uh, as they could. Uh, a recovery, a simulated recovery from fall in which the person lay prone for three and a half minutes and on mark stood up as quickly as they could and remained standing for uh, a period of time. Uh, then we did a... Uh, a um, Test where we were looking at uh, at uh, the cardiovascular function, which I won't cover here at all. Uh, we did something. We looked at uh, endpoint nystagmus uh, by having the person follow your finger. Uh, we did uh, eye head uh, hand coordination testing. We looked at dysmetria. Uh, it's a simply a test where touch my my finger, touch your nose touch my finger, touch your nose with both the left and right hands. Uh, we did uh, uh, muscle uh, memory and uh, tandem walk, heel to toe, both with the eyes open and the eyes closed, and then walking straight, uh, stepping over an obstacle, and then turning the corner. Uh, we did uh, a push test. This was primarily a Russian version and then we asked them to jump from a 12-inch platform, and we did rock translation. This was only done back at the Johnson Space Center, and this was essentially looking at their ability to collect samples and, uh, and, and work with bending over and then standing up. And then we looked at dynamic visual acuity uh, back at the Johnson Space Center. What we found was that 18% of the crew couldn't even attempt the testing, uh, particularly on the, uh, in the field. And 42 uh, of the crew members that we tested attempted to do the testing, but uh, couldn't complete it. Uh, most crew that could not uh, complete the testing and landing did do it at uh, 12 hours later at the refueling stop. Uh, most symptoms seem to improve significantly within uh, 48 hours, but full recovery for many of the measurements that we were making uh, didn't really recover until approximately 30 days after the flight. Here is the tandem walk, and there's two strategies here. One is, is 
eyes closed, you can see he's not doing very good. Eyes open, it's doing better. That is one of the best that we saw, by the way. Both with the eyes closed and the eyes open. The next slide show uh, the uh, crew member doing it with a different strategy. He couldn't pick up his feet. If one foot lost contact with the floor, it was impossible for him to stay upright. So you see with eyes closed a very shuffling gait, uh, much like you see in extremely elderly people. With the eyes open, he really couldn't do much different. He had to, he never could manage to do a tandem uh, position at all. I don't know why it's not playing. There you go. <clears throat> and for the, the, the U.S. side of this, uh, future water landings are on the horizon, and uh, that really causes us a lot of concern for, some, for several reasons. One is that uh, it's a very dynamic environment. Uh, it's probably going to increase the risk of, of the crew uh, in the the, the conditions that they have in terms of their stability. And there always is an increased risk of uh, uh, exacerbating motion sickness and increased risk of falls uh, because of an unstable surface. Now, all of this becomes important because the, uh, the crews are going to require significant assistance uh, immediately post-landing. Uh, help walking, uh, there's going to have to be considerable amount of medical interventions. Water landings also mean that there's no ability for us to minimize motion input to the crew. That is, during the landing and once they're on the, on, in the water, uh, they still have a great deal of motion, which is going to be a problem. Uh, we have to optimize strategies to manage the increased risk that this is, uh, this is causing or going to cause. And we have to assume a number of things. One is that uh, we're, we're going to see uh, even more severe motion sickness, uh, uh, compromised balance and, and ability to walk even to get out of the restraint couch uh, during the landing and after landing. Uh, there's going to be an inaccuracy potentially, uh, particularly that we saw with uh, the dysmetria uh, on, on switch throws and, and most of the uh, new uh, capsules for landing, both ours and SpaceX and Boeing, have essentially a glass cockpit. 
that is they're touching a screen and that could potentially be even more uh, uh, of a difficult thing than simply throwing switches. Uh, there is going to be a decreased ability to control the body position and head movements of any kind are going to aggravate symptoms that are already present. Uh, consideration of all these limits uh, will enable better ops uh, development for how we treat the crew immediately after landing. I'm not going to read this slide to you, but uh, there's a number of factors that's going to influence the primary sensory changes and performance. I think that uh, that one of the most important ones that we're going to be looking at is uh, uh, is that the architecture of the spacecraft uh, it becomes the module is very complex in terms of its layout with the uh, uh, vertical cues that aren't going to ever be aligned with the navigational aids that you can see. That is, uh, within the capsule, uh, upright is is essentially defined by what you see visually in the capsule itself. You can't trust your ears and the stimulus system to give you the kind of information that you might need. Now, we can talk about developing countermeasures uh, for some of these symptoms that we see. Uh, it's a very difficult thing to do because here we, we have a time and function management problem all over again. Uh, in order to be uh, really useful and something that can, we could uh, ask the crew to do they have to be very simple uh, and effective in, in resolving the symptoms that we see. They have to be easily implemented, and they shouldn't have to train to use the, the countermeasure. It should be something that can be implemented quickly and without a whole lot of pre-flight or in-flight training. Uh, and we can't have countermeasures that begin to interfere with the mission objectives. For example, uh, it should require minimal hardware and storage volume for the reasons I talked about in one of the previous um, slideshows. Um, and we have to minimize as much as we possibly can an impact on crew uh, time. This just shows that there are going to be a number of, of individual differences between the people that we see. Uh, Every crew member experiences some degree of landing motion sickness, of course, uh, and there's going to be enormous variation across uh, crew members' functional performance. Potential countermeasures, then, if we follow the guidelines that I listed earlier, uh, would essentially end up being medication. Uh, and uh, there's a possibility that even centrifugation in flight which will control somewhat, hopefully, the, the uh, morphological changes that we're seeing in the otoconia in the vestibular system. Uh, there is a system using vibrotactile, excuse me, uh, awareness, essentially using tactors that vibrate on various parts of the body to define uh, what's up, what's down, uh, what's to the side. And there is a possibility that if it's done properly, that, that head movements during the landing phase can be very beneficial. If they're done impro improperly, then they're going to be devastating. Uh, there is also the possibility that uh, we could uh, uh, provide an artificial horizon within the lander itself so that they knew where the vertical upright was. Uh, sensory motor training, motor training is another uh, potential, but it is takes a lot of training pre-flight in order to be able to implement this correctly, and that really violates the, uh, uh, the list of things where we need to keep uh, 
the countermeasures as simple as possible. Stroboscopic vision uh, seems to work very well, as a matter of fact, and could be one of the more uh, important countermeasures that, that we try. Uh, prediction based on, on uh, performance, if we refly crew members, uh, is not necessarily ever going to be terribly accurate. The only accurate thing about prediction is that if you had difficulty and sickness and were unable to function after your first, second, or third flight, then on the fourth flight, you're going to have the exact same problem. Uh, galvanic stimulation as a training exercise might be, might be helpful. So, uh, the water landings are where we're going to have the most difficulty. Um, uh, so far, we've been, you know, landing uh, on the ground in the Soyuz craft. And uh, while there are a number of problems with that, uh, the one problem that doesn't exist is that, uh, is that the, once the, the capsule hits the ground, with a force, by the way, of a 20 mile per hour, a rear end collision, uh, then uh, uh, nothing's moving any longer. Uh, they're, they're, the capsule, the visual world moves in tandem with them in the, in the water landing craft, as I said before, and there's no available horizon in this we provided, our official one. Um, spatial orientation is always going to be compromised and disorientation is extremely likely to occur. This gives you an idea of the way the spacecraft is going to set in the water. Uh, the major problems that we have here are essentially if we can't get to the crew for some reason, or and they do have to exit the, the capsule on their own, then such an autonomous landing uh, is going to be uh, extremely dangerous. And on remote planetary surfaces, you don't have an option. They're going to have to get out themselves anyway. Uh, the drugs, as I mentioned earlier, do have problems. Uh, we can only use those drugs at certain and specific times during the mission so that they don't interact with the functionality of the crew in, in configuring the spacecraft for landing and during the landing process itself. And regardless of the efficacy of the drugs, they all will have side effects. And drug interactions are a strong possibility. And as I indicated earlier, uh, drug quality uh, is, is somewhat uh, deteriorated probably by radiation in flight and bioavailability of the drug uh, is going to be reduced during the space flight itself. Uh, the stroboscopic vision uh, is, is in fact very, very good at uh, preventing motion sickness or reducing the, the symptoms. Uh, we've tried it in all kinds of uh, moving environments. Uh, we were working with the Army and looking at uh, uh, strobing the black back of the Black Hawk helicopter, where the people back there are essentially targeting uh, enemy, and uh, they're in the dark with a, with only a display, and it's very provocative. Uh, the goggles seems seem to help very nicely, as a matter of fact. Uh, vibrotactile awareness. Uh, seems to work extremely well. Uh, as a matter of fact, we have uh, used vibrotactile input uh, on a flight from uh, uh, Pensacola Air Base to Houston uh, with the person blindfolded once the landing or once the takeoff was, was completed and uh, had no problem at all. As you can see from this, uh, nulling a motion uh, using a vibrotactile input on the body with only four tactors is uh, actually extremely effective. 
uh, head movements uh, will work. We really do believe uh, as long as we minimize those at the initial uh, uh, exposure to to the gravitational vector and uh, making small yaw and pitch homo, homo head movements, you know, I think are the way we want to start. Um, and if the head movement, even when we move it very, very small, a small amount, uh, and at a very slow velocity, uh, can be very effective, particularly if searching for an area where they begin to uh, experience motion sickness and have to back off. Um, and uh, opening your eyes, closing your eyes to get a, a, a um, essentially some visual feedback as to what their position is in terms of the spacecraft is going to be, be helpful with head movements. Um, during recovery um, out of the Soviet, 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 Soviet head seat, uh, yaw movements with the head when the head is erect are the least provocative for finding out. Um, and if we begin with yaw head movements, I think that uh, we'll see some improvement. And uh, then as symptoms allow, we ask them to make larger and larger head movements and of course take frequent rest when it's, when it's necessary. One of the things that we've been trying to do uh, literally for oh, almost 70 years is if we go to space, we need to provide a gravitation vector that allows people to say, either keep uh, the, cons the, 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 the benefits of uh, a, a gravitational field or essentially provide one that uh, will momentarily or over a period of time help us to uh, uh, minimize the kinds of things that we expect to see on landing and particularly autonomous landings after very long periods of flight. Uh, in order to do that, however, it requires a centrifuge of some kind. Uh, the original concepts, of course, were rotating the whole spacecraft. Uh, we don't need to do that, but we have very little space available in the in the vehicles that are going to be using to go to Mars, say, for example. Uh, so, is there something else we can do in order to provide uh, the 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 acceleration that, that's needed uh, and to uh, maintain? Uh, the G vector that's necessary. As it turns out, uh, they are using uh, a training technique with a small radius centrifuge that can essentially allow us to get up to uh, uh, 300 revolutions uh, per minute. And that's pretty exciting. I can show you what it looks like here. It's essentially just a harness and a swivel. Now, since the otoliths are co-located on the, on the center axis of the head, you're getting a small amount of, uh, of, uh, of a G vector across the otolith plane by doing this. And of course, they can control that uh, velocity and consequently the, the amplitude or the G field by by extending a limb. Artificial horizon looks something like this. It can be a laser beam, 
that's probably uh, one of the easiest things. The only problem with that is that uh, with the laser, with this only one line within the vehicle, uh, you may not be able to always see it or keep it acquired uh, during the time that you're trying to exit the vehicle. Another, uh, even simpler uh, one is just to hang a rope from the center of the vehicle and and use that as uh, the the upright. This gives you an idea of the kind of head movements that we've been talking about. And minimizing hair cell sensitivity to the gravitational change, uh, either through the centrifugation or, or other techniques, uh, is high on the list of a potential countermeasure. Um, galvanic stimulation before flight, where it's used to disrupt postural control, uh, may be one of the ways that we can begin to, to look at, at, at a pre-flight training. However, it's pre-flight again, and uh, you can see what it looks like uh, in terms of even a small amount of current across the uh, uh, temporal bones. Uh, you do begin to essentially be able to ignore the disorientation and sway that uh, the galvanic stimulation can provide uh, might take up to 30 weeks so how uh, stroboscopic vision this shows uh, what it looks like in terms of uh, of uh, uh, wearing the stroboscopic uh, goggles and uh, being in a uh, darkened, uh, slightly lit room and attempting to read while making head, head movements. Uh, with the goggles themselves, it almost reduces the, the motion sickness to levels that are extremely susceptible. It works very well in uh, motion sickness for riding in cars uh, and uh, uh, planes and uh, really almost every motion platform that you can think of. I was given several questions to answer and this one seemed like a good introduction. I know that a lot of individuals that I have worked with over the time of my tenure at NASA seem to know what they wanted to be when they were children. I can't say that I was one of them. In fact, uh, far from it. I was raised as an only child on the high plains of southeastern Colorado. Growing up, the only thing that I knew about spaceflight was what I saw at our local movie house. Serial shorts like Buck Rogers were always shown before the main feature. I was a teenager by the time the TV broadcasts reached our little town population probably right around 2000. Uh, the first real encounter with outer space came with the launch of the Russian Sputnik. I had no idea what I would do after I graduated from high school. I was not a good student. I didn't study. I was more interested in cars and girls. I was married by the time I was 17. I'm still married to the same wonderful woman for 60 years. She understands my passion and commitment to my research. Always asks me what I'm playing with today when I come home. I didn't have such a wonderful and supportive parents. I probably would never have gone to college. Once enrolled, I was lucky to have finished the first semester. My study habits were not the best. I had no idea what my major should or would be until I took a course in experimental psychology. After graduation, I was surprised when several graduate schools accepted me. I thought it might be interesting to become a clinical psychologist, since they seemed to make a good living. I selected Miami University in Oxford, Ohio. 
as my graduate school. Turns out that the departing chairman had admitted every application. Apparently, he was unhappy for some unknown reason. Well, his decision resulted in admitting 64 students instead of the usual 10 or 12. The chairman's action led to establishment of a pro-seminar, which I'm sure is very much unlike the pro-seminar that you're in. Uh, this one was designed to force students to leave. Not kidding you. For hours, five days a week, for two semesters, and 20,000 pages of reading for each semester. By the end of the second semester, the 64 students were reduced to 16. It was during the first semester that my life and career goals changed. A clinical psychologist was lecturing on Maslow's clinical theories that did it, and that did it for me. He was explaining Maslow's two concepts of cognition. When he got to Maslow's B cognition and explaining the perfect example was that biting into a cream puff could be the equivalent of an orgasm. Well, I closed my notebook and I left the room. There was no way I could continue along the path of being a clinical psychologist. Sorry if I offended any clinical psychology people here. Anyway, I ended up in the restroom where I ran into a red-headed, freckled kid. I was raging about the clinical psychology to this kid when he said, if you can build me a functional ear, I'll give you a job. Turned out he was a professor named Don Parker, one of the most intelligent people I've ever known. Also, one of the most difficult. If he didn't think I was working hard enough, he would always say, I hear that you can make a pretty good living and money in the hardware business. Long story short, I built the ear and my path was set. After I graduated, Don and I remained friends and co-workers until his accidental death only a few years ago. Following graduation, I took a job as a postdoc at Princeton, but left because the pay couldn't support my family. The alternative was to take a teaching position at Franklin Pierce University in New Hampshire. At the end of my first semester, I realized that I was not a teacher. As luck would have it, I received a call from NASA offering me a position in the vestibular lab. Within 12 years, I was the head of the lab, becoming the chief of all NASA neuroscience. And so it goes. My career rests on a cream puff. The larger questions that I was asked to answer. Uh, it's a good one. And uh, I think I've got some, some good answers as well. I've also added in uh, some of the other aspects that were asked of me and other questions and uh, perhaps you'll be able to ferret those out. It's certainly worth saying at this point that uh, that uh, the Gallaudet 11 has always been a big influence on most of the work that's been done with spaceflight and the vestibular system. With that said, I would like to uh, show you this while I talk a little bit, but just point out that it's some people, some pioneers in uh, vestibular spaceflight research that you can find in these slides. Uh, for example, uh, John Lee of uh, John Lee and, and uh, fame with the book uh, Lee and Z. Uh, here we've got, uh, I'm trying to find my cursor, here is uh, Dr. Scott Wood. Uh, down here is uh, Jacob Bloomberg and, uh, and Anessa uh, Kosliska. And uh, here is, uh, uh, is uh, Captain Rupert.
and Gilles Clément is next to him on his right, and then looking further over, you've got uh, Ludmila uh, Kornileva and uh, Anessa Kosovska, both the both very top Russian scientists. And in the corner is Fred Gedry. I don't know how many of you have read his uh, work, but it's extraordinary. Well, that said, uh, I'd like to just begin by saying that my research has its roots in spaceflight. Uh, the spaceflight scientific community that my work resides in is very small within the United States and really around the world. Frankly, the majority of the scientific world is typically not interested that much in what we do. This is true even though dizziness and headache are the two most complaints during hospital admission. But if you want to break things down, uh, research questions are typically driven by two factors. A specific problem with vestibular function either exists or is studied to define as many parameters as possible, or a known problem, for example, medical or otherwise, becomes more prevalent and needs additional definition and investigation. The exciting part is when an existing research methodology is discovered and an unknown factor because the research allows for open-ended findings. That is, an issue is identified either as clinically driven or simply asking how something works. You may not be able to separate the two. You may have to gain knowledge on how a particular part of the sensory system functions to understand what or why that system is not behaving as expected. For example, I said before, uh, the two most common symptoms expressed prior to admittance to a hospital are headache and dizziness. Added to the finding that headache and dizziness represent common complaints. Approximately 70 million Americans have experienced some form of vestibular dysfunction. For example, uh, commonly diagnosed vestibular disorders like benign proximal, proximal positional vertigo. I have a hard time saying that. I don't know why. And, uh, and uh, labyrinth, labyrinthitis and vestibular neuritis, uh, Meniere's disease, and secondary endolymphatic high drops. All of these are very serious. And yet, it's taken years before uh, we begin to look at the, at the benign proximal positional vertical, BPPV, as something extremely serious in terms of what people come to a doctor for, uh, even though it was really discovered. Uh, I can't remember the, the date it was discovered, but about 20 years before people started actually seeing that it was amongst the most common complaint. And still to this date, a lot of, uh, of uh, doctors don't treat it. They give them drugs for dizziness or some such thing. Uh, the issues, however, that we deal with are all related to the vestibular system and sensory motor system uh, to, and, and their response to spaceflight. So our population is rather small and an opportunity to investigate the vestibular response to a weightless state or hypo or hypergravity environments are tied to the launch of a spacecraft. You don't have the option of calling back your subjects if something goes wrong. Issues that we must deal with include time and weight or mass and subject availability. Time is always a factor. Access to crew members is limited. An astronaut's training, for example, takes most of the time available. Life sciences as a discipline only gets a few hours of crew time, at best. If your investigation requires measurements during the flight, you will encounter factors like crew time, volume and weight of the experimental hardware. For example, 
launch one pound into orbit. The cost is approximately $10,000. The estimated cost of putting that same pound on the moon is $1.5 million. A launch can cost as much as $20 million just to launch. So the lesson is twofold. Keep the experiment simple, small, and light. Your best bet is to concentrate on pre- and post-flight experimentation where you have more time and things like uh, weight, mass, don't matter. A real problem is related to how soon, once you achieve orbit, you can e expect your experiment to be activated. In the past, that time could be as long as three days. If you're doing vestibular or sensory motor experimentation, this is a real limit. You want to know how the vestibular and sensory motor systems are functioning the second that the spacecraft reaches MECO, that is main engine cutoff, and weightlessness is the new normal environment. One of the prime reasons for waiting that long is related to Motion sickness. We currently have an experiment that will begin performing a standard vestibular clinical exam almost as soon as the crew reach the International Space Station. This experiment is very unusual in its goals. Now, I'd like to ask you a question. How does science advance in a particular field? Is it a linear function? Does each new finding add to the previous knowledge based on a specific hypothesis? <coughs> Excuse me. Or is it nonlinear? That is, does a new discovery that does not fit within the established hypotheses advance the science in a more step like function? If you have not read Thomas Kuhn's The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, I urge you to find a copy. It's old, but they're still available, and read it. Science is akin to war warfare in some respects. Research, an attempt to force nature into conceptual boxes that are supplied by your professional education. You will belong to a group called a paradigm, or you will, you will build a paradigm around which you will define your science. Should another group of scientists discover a finding that does not fit within the existing paradigm, the whole new paradigm will emerge. The new paradigm causes a step in the nonlinear, not linear, but non but nonlinear advancement of the science. Learn to recognize when to move from the old to the new paradigm. As an example, this is my own field we discovered with, with a very simple experiment that the sensations encountered uh, to the exposure to a linear acceleration shortly expressed after spaceflight is different than what the old paradigm would expect. Unusual cues of the motion of the swing uh, from uh, tactile receptors and uh, it has a head restraint system that uh, clamps to the top of the head, the side of the head, with a, uh, a bite bar that the subject's teeth fit into. Standing next to it is uh, uh, Don Parker, my major professor, who he and I were working on this, in, on this project together long after I graduated. Uh, I'm the motor for the swing in the right hand picture. Uh, the concept was very simple to see if space flight changed the sensitivity in your perception of linear acceleration. So we're doing very small steps uh, moving this, this parallel swing uh, only slightly and larger and larger and so on until the subject recognizes and feels that uh, uh, he's experienced the linear motion. Then he pushes a switch. Uh, we also were able to move this this whole uh, drum that the person was encased in uh, in two other fashions. Uh, one was uh, 
we could roll it like a barbecue spit, oscillate it really, uh, back and forth as, as, as if it were a barbecue spit. And then uh, we could do the barbecue spit rotation and the parallel swing at the same time. So you've got, uh, you, you've got uh, barbecue motion and uh, linear acceleration. So, let's see here. This is what we found. Uh, it's very simple. We asked the crew member, uh, in this case, uh, Dr. Bill Thornton, astronaut, to draw his sensation. Uh, it turns out, that, number one, that there wasn't any change in the linear acceleration. It was essentially the same thresholds that we would see before flight. Uh, this is what uh, he experienced during uh, roll motion, uh, a typical motion back and forth in the roll plane. Uh, linear acceleration uh, was basically entirely linear, except for the, the turnaround of the swing, which usually causes a slight sensation of, uh, of movement, uh, angular movement up. And then the roll and linear movement together produce what you think they would produce. They were drawn there. Um, and uh, then in the next slide, you can see uh, what happened after the flight. Uh, linear acceleration remained very linear. The roll acceleration, on the other hand, tilt, essentially, um, felt as if uh, it was primarily linear. And this held for up to 10 days or so after the flight. <coughs> you notice linear still remains pretty linear. And immediately after the flight, the roll is, uh, if you combine it with the linear acceleration, is primarily perceived as 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 roll uh, or uh, without any linear component based on top of it so this was a very strange experience essentially there wasn't any particular reason that you would have this sensation that is particularly in the roll mode, where roll is now perceived as more of a linear acceleration. So, what do you think is happening here? Well, it's fairly simple, uh, as it turns out. Um, it took a very long time for us to figure it out. Then we begin this experiment for the first time at uh, 3 o'clock in the morning. And on the flight line at uh, Edwards Air Force Base. And uh, we spent at least two hours walking around in circles trying to make sense of what we were seeing here. And when the concept really began to become solid, it made a whole lot of sense. But it didn't fit with the hypothesis that the rest of the world would be looking for. So it's a perfect example. I want to be really clear on this one pitch motion. Would you say that one more time? I want to be really time? clear on this one pitch motion. I felt like when I pitched and I, of course, had a headrest behind me, so I couldn't pitch back. And I, of course, had a headrest behind me, so I couldn't pitch back. But I felt like when I pitched, I went forward. But I felt like when I pitched, I went forward. And when I went this way, I went that way. And actually, when I rolled, I felt like I went that way, too. Roll All the, left, the okay. different okay. motions. Roll, roll left, left, right. Which direction okay. you feel? If I roll, then I went that way. And when I rolled this way, I felt like I went that way. And this direction, I think, was the same way. That I trying to quantitate now exactly um, the difference between the yaw and the roll. Um, but they all felt like I translated in the direction that I rotated. Oh. Um,
Yeah, so uh, what do you think? There is no sensation of, uh, of tilt. There's no sensation of anything except translation. So that essentially is, is what the experiment found. Now the problem is that uh, uh, if our hypothesis were truly perfect and accurate, then she wouldn't feel, for example, that when she tilts her head to her right, that she moves translation-wise in that same direction. It should be in the opposite direction. And the same for forward pitch, backward pitch. Uh, they sh you should feel that uh, your movie is being transla translated uh, in the other direction as a, opposed to the tilt. Now, uh, I'd like to show you something just a little fun. What is happening is that uh, uh, if you look at the otolith and what it does, that uh, uh, if I pitch my head down in, in a 1G environment, okay, you get a displacement of the otoconia forward. Now, that's actually the same as being accelerated backward. Now, if Einstein is right, gravity and acceleration are equivalent. Now, in zero G, what happens if I pitch my head forward? Nothing. There's no, there's no acceleration or gravity to essentially displace the otoconia. Now, in 1G or 0G, if I use a forward or side to side uh, translation, the otolith is displaced. But what has happened is that uh, uh, the person begins to reinterpret the motion in spaceflight. Since with a forward head tilt, for example, there's no sensation of, of tilt, they begin to interpret any displacement of the otoconia as, uh, as a linear translation. So when we return to the Earth, and I now have a displacement of the otoconia due to the acceleration or, or the gravitational vector, uh, their sensation is immediately not tilt, but linear. So it, uh, it was a new hypothesis that uh, it is, people are still fighting it, but it's, it's still existing. It's interesting, and it, has, it only has one big problem. Uh, and I'll tell you what that is. As soon as you listen to uh, Dr. Ray Seddon's description of how she felt, after landing, before I move on. And that is, uh, at one point in time, uh, the, the American Gymnastics Association uh, believed that they could help NASA with this motion sickness problem. And uh, they wanted to come to the, the Space Center and be tested and show us that they were, in fact, because they were gymnasts and because of the way they trained, that they were, in fact, not going to be susceptible to motion sickness. Uh, here's just a few of them. These were some of the, some of the medal winners um, at the, in those games. And uh, good, uh, they managed to not show very much sickness as not actually what you see in the picture, that's just fake. But they they uh, had very little symptoms in, in motion. Very provocative uh, experiment here. Uh, so, what we did was uh, put them on the KC-135, a parabolic airplane. And uh, 
I put my 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 uh, prediction sealed in an envelope of what would happen to these people. And uh, what do you think happened? They were sick as dogs. Uh, this shows they were there were in fact eight of them, and all got sick in parabolic flight within 20 param parabolas, except for one of them. Uh, why is that so? Why do you think I would have predicted that? Well, the answer is really pretty simple, and that is that uh, gymnasts do what they do because they use gravity to do it. If you take away gravity and they move, it's going to be very disturbing. So, there's more to come, but that's all I have for you now. Thank you very much, and hope to see you in person sometime.